Um, so next we have Michael Frank, who is associate professor um, in the psychology department at Stanford University. He received his BA and BS uh, from Stanford in 2004 and his PhD from MIT in 2010. His research lies at the intersection of social cognition and language acquisition. So more specifically, he studies children's learning mechanisms and how they apply to social word learning and pragmatic reasoning. He also studies the role of language and numerical cognition across different cultures and countries. Um, he uses a wide suite of uh, methodologies to do this research, including behavioral experiments, computational tools models, and also some cutting edge uh, measurement approaches such as eye tracking and head mounted cameras. Frank has received several prestigious awards, including the Cognitive Science Society's Mar Ward in, uh, Prize excuse me, in 2008, and also has an extensive public re publication record um, publishing in journals such as Cognition, Cognitive Science, and Perspectives on Psychological Science. Um, today he's going to talk to us about moving towards a more cumulative research practice and how to get there. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so I'm a uh, psychologist. I'm a developmental psychologist. And I'm going to be speaking to you from the perspective of somebody uh, who is engaged in doing experimental research. And my concerns as an experimental researcher are thinking about how to move our uh, research practice in small, feasible ways towards, uh, as you'll see, the idea of a more cumulative way of uh, creating knowledge as opposed to uh, you know, sort of a one-off finding type of model. So uh, we got a nice introduction to the uh, recent study by the Open Science Collaboration uh, in an earlier talk. Um, so nearly everybody in the room is likely aware of it. Um, are there other authors of this paper in the room right now? Hello. Uh, nice to meet you. It's wonderful, wonderful to meet uh, you know, some of the uh, 269 other authors on this paper, um, sometimes for the first time. Uh, so, uh, as you know, this, this study reported results from 100 independent replications of high-profile studies in uh, psychology, social and cognitive psychology primarily. Uh, and it was quite disappointing that fewer than half of these uh, replications, by many estimates, uh, by a variety of different criteria, produced the same result as the original. And I, I'm really proud that four of these replications were contributed by students in my graduate class, which is Laboratory and Experimental Methods. Um, this is a class in which students carry out replications of previously published findings uh, over the course of a quarter. And uh, this was the first iteration of that class, but in subsequent classes, we've uh, continued to do this. Uh, most recently this year, it's really exciting, we uh, did a pre-registered suite of replications of uh, studies from the journal Psychological Science uh, from last year's volume, so 2015. Uh, and uh, we were highly successful in a number of those uh, replications, that was very exciting and fun. Um, this study has received a tremendous amount of discussion, the Open Science Framework study, uh, and uh, a number of critiques. And uh, I think it, some of these critiques are um, maybe overly intense, but they, uh, they focus on something that I think is important, which is that the estimate, uh, th this, this paper is, is uh, should be interpreted a little bit more cautiously than perhaps the initial reports. Uh, chose to interpret it, and especially the media coverage. Um, namely, that this is, the, uh, this is an estimate of the probability that a single lab can reproduce a single statistical test with only one try. Uh, and that's in contrast to a much more sweeping interpretation, which it was easy to give to this paper, uh, that it was an estimate of the proportion of true effects in the literature. And, and it most certainly was not an unbiased estimate of that number. Uh, more generally, uh, the study it cannot be definitive uh, because single studies, replications or original studies are never definitive. And progress towards understanding whether an effect is true and more broadly whether that effect provides support for a theory that it has uh, explanatory and predictive value, uh, that progress needs to be cumulative. So the question I ask as a, a working researcher is how do we make our research more cumulative? So I want to tell you about a number of uh, principles that I've been trying to follow and exploring in my own work and in my teaching to make research in the experimental sciences, especially psychology, more cumulative. Uh, the first is have more people in the research. The second 
Uh, conduct multiple internal replications. Don't wait for the laborious process of independent verification, independent replication of an effect, uh, but build cumulatively within a study set. The third has been a move in the statistical frameworks we use away from statistical significance as the key indicator and towards measurement and estimation. And this is much more a mindset than a specific set of tools, I would say. Uh, so it's not so much throwing out the software or the particular test, but rather uh, thinking about the metrics that we care the most about and the ways that we interpret our data. Uh, fourth, uh, some psychology specific or at least experimental behavioral science specific tools uh, for debugging experiments, which I've come to believe are more critical uh, in ruling out or at least making less likely uh, artifactual results. So these are things like manipulation checks or negative and positive control groups. Fifth, uh, pre-registration where appropriate, and it's often appropriate. Uh, and sixth, everything open, materials, data, and code by default. Uh, and in each of these cases, I'm gonna be talking about defaults rather than prescriptions. And I think this, for me, this is very important. Because as I talk to my colleagues and as I teach and as I interact with folks outside of psychology, I realize there's an incredible variety of different approaches to research. And it, it is very damaging, perhaps the most damaging thing to the cause of greater transparency uh, and best practices in the social sciences to prescribe things too early uh, and uh, risk alienating folks for whom uh, certain practices are simply not the best choice. Okay, so I'll, I'll walk you through these decisions uh, or these recommendations, these defaults um, via three case studies from my own work. Uh, the first case study on um, what's called social sampling the second case study on implicit theory of mind, and the third case study, a field trial of uh, math apps. So this is, a, uh, uh, this is a project that was done by a student in my lab, Molly Tenenbaum. Excuse me, um, Molly Lewis, um, uh, replicating a finding by, by Josh Tenenbaum. Uh, so uh, this, the original uh, paper here that we were interested in was a finding by Shu and Tenenbaum, 2007. Um, they found this kind of interesting uh, result, which was that when uh, you give examples to a learner to, uh, to learn from, to generalize a new concept, to generalize a new idea, uh, the process by which those examples are sampled, picked from the broader set of possible examples, seems to matter to the generalizations that the learner makes. So that's both for adults and for children. I'll focus on the adults here. Uh, so they generally, um, they found that a knowledgeable teacher um, who appeared to be sampling with the person in mind, the learner in mind, uh, gave examples that led to tighter and stronger generalizations than uh, if the learner themselves picked the examples ignorantly. Uh, and they rep reported a very large effect size, so in standardized units, this was uh, north of uh, one standard deviation between experimental and control groups, but with a very small uh, sample of adults, 15 adults. Uh, so this is a theoretically important uh, paper, it's well cited, uh, and Molly in her first year project went to try and um, reproduce this finding so that she could build on it for uh, future investigations. And to our surprise, in a completely unpre-registered, totally exploratory ad hoc sample uh, on the internet that we continued adding to as we failed to find the predicted result, uh, we got an effect size estimate that was not different from zero. So we just kind of, we added some participants, we mucked around, and we did not get this, uh, this finding. Then um, in a slightly more confirmatory version of this, we tweaked a couple details, kept most of the procedure the same, reran with a planned sample of 150, found slightly larger effect, but didn't get uh, a, a statistically significant result either. Uh, both of these replications were conducted on the internet. We thought that might be the uh, culprit, so we conducted a, an exact replication in the lab. 40 people, slightly larger effect, still not statistically reliable. Uh, then um, we tweaked yet another detail. Um, we conducted a planned sample of 200 people on the internet. Got a slightly larger effect now, significantly different from zero. Smaller than the original, but uh, looking more reasonable. Um, and then finally, we conducted a large pre-registered exact replication of study four um, and got a, a nice tight estimate that lined up reasonably well with the uh, previous study. Taken together, uh, the strength of the evidence here is uh, very clear that we have a real effect. The effect is modest. It's um, less than half as big as was originally reported, depending on exactly how you do the meta-analysis. 
Um, but I think this case study illustrates a number of really important things about cumulative progress in experimental psychology, at least. Uh, because if this were the open science framework uh, study, we would have been doing uh, study one there, or maybe that was a little ad hoc, study two, uh, and we would have concluded that this, this effect was false. Uh, and I don't think this effect is false. This is a real effect. Uh, it's just bigger than was, uh, it's, the uh, original estimate was biased, so it's, it appeared bigger than it actually is. Uh, and there were some methodological details that were tricky and took a while to work out. This is the messy truth of much of experimental psychology, that uh, true or false, these uh, binary dichotomies that often enter into our interpretations of findings are just not really very useful constructs. Uh, what we want to know is how big is it, uh, how reliably can I get it across uh, different settings. Uh, and the answer here was if you poke around, you can get it pretty reliably, but it's not as big as we thought. Um, so the larger ends here helped us estimate the effects, which were present but smaller than affected, and multiple iterations uh, this fast iteration was really critical to us in revealing the true pattern of data. Uh, the second case study I want to tell you about uh, is about an experiment uh, published in 2010. Um, it's called the Social Sense, Susceptibility to Other Beliefs in uh, Human uh, Infants and Adults. So this was a, a kind of a tricky, very clever, really interesting paradigm that revealed uh, an implicit sensitivity to what somebody else was thinking uh, in both adults and infants, and this was big news for psychologists who are interested in this sort of thing because most of our methods for studying others' beliefs are explicit. We ask kids, what was person X thinking? And then when we're surprised that you know, three-year-olds can't do this task, well, maybe it's because they're not very good at explicitly articulating their thoughts about this particular topic. So an implicit measure was really big news and exciting for us. Uh, the way the paradigm worked, um, and this will tell you, this is very revealing about methods in developmental psychology more generally. Uh, here's this ball. The ball gets hidden behind the, uh, the screen. There's a smurf that witnesses the, uh, the hiding, because, you know, smurfs. Um, and then, uh, you know, the smurf can, is going to leave or stay there, and the ball is either going to stay behind the screen or not. Um, and here's the key finding. Uh, so, okay, we've got um, the participant's belief on the uh, horizontal um, and the agent's belief uh, um, in the line type. So the participant can either think the ball is back there or not. The agent can either think that's, uh, that's the smurf, can either think that the ball is back there or not. Um, and what we see is an interaction such that if neither of them think the ball is back there, uh, the, um, your uh, detection response, your reaction time is slowed. Okay, you don't think the ball's back there and you're slow to say it's back there, that's unsurprising. The cool finding is that if, the, if this smurf, this kind of irrelevant smurf thinks the ball is back there, you're actually apparently slightly faster to, uh, to respond that the ball is present. So in my class, a student, Desmond Ong, uh, decided to reproduce the adult portion of these uh, results. He created a nice paradigm with the planned sample, power analysis based on the original. He ran it, here's one of these. Um, and indeed, we reproduced every single statistical test that we had set out to reproduce. There was a suite of statistical tests on this pattern, and we reproduced those. Um, but because of the focus on um, estimating the actual effect sizes, we found um, an unpredicted uh, measurement, which is um, when uh, both the agent and the participant thought the ball was back there, participants were also kind of slow. Um, and uh, over a series of iterations in collaboration with uh, Jonathan Phillips, who was at Yale at the time, a uh, number of other folks, we debugged this experiment. We checked um, why it could be that we got this kind of unpredicted increase in reaction time. There was a little teeny increase, but we found it in many different samples. And we finally uh, came up with a very, very boring uh, explanation of this, which is that um, when the Smurf left the screen, adults and the participant had to hit a key to indicate that they were paying attention. The timing of that key press co-varied with the con condition, leading to a spillover effect on the reaction time. Uh, and when that check was removed, there was no reaction time difference. Uh, and when we artificially balanced the timing of the uh, check, we could create the reaction time difference. And we went through a number of experimental hoops to show that this um, artifact of the experimental paradigm was creating the reaction time difference. So um, this is a you know, very uh, sort of a sad day for our um, methodological progress here, but um, was a very interesting debugging process, and it, to me it really revealed two generalizations. First, uh, 
statistical significance is at best a beginning. Here we replicated the statistical significance wildly. Uh, we did so in experiment after experiment, but the measurements failed to match the theory. And by focusing on the measurement, we were able to understand what the source of the anomaly was. Second, uh, iterated debugging using both positive and negative controls. Uh, controls where we should expect nothing to be present unless something was truly going wrong, or controls where we should expect an effect to be present unless something was truly going wrong. These really helped us reveal the confound and figure out what was actually going on here, and what was going on was not the claimed interpretation. So I think this is the, you know, this is in some sense just uh, paradigmatic science. You just kind of work through and figure out how the theory matches the data, but there were critical methodological shifts for me that were important in figuring out this effect. Uh, namely, uh, getting away from thinking about the p-values and starting to think about the magnitudes and the way the magnitudes of the measurements related to the theory. The last case study I want to mention uh, has to do with pre-registration. So um, this was a paper published uh, last year in the fall. Um, so this is a very high quality field trial of a uh, math app, um, it's bedtime math at home, parents were randomly assigned to the math group or the uh, the reading group, their kids' standardized test scores were taken prior to uh, random assignment. Afterwards, we got um, high quality standardized tests, so good, good outcome measures, pre-post design, uh, very nice uh, working with the app creators to get um, measures of usage. So really kind of high quality trial, good data collection, uh, great ends. Um, and here's the kind of headline finding, the figure one of the paper, I believe. Uh, and what you see is a subgroup analysis that shows for um, a matched, a subsample matched math group um, and the reading group, uh, when you median split on the usage of the app, you get this interaction such that high usage in the math group but not the reading group uh, creates a uh, high, um, uh, high change over the course of the year. So this, is, uh, this was worrisome to me in a number of ways. Uh, most notably that the headline finding is on a kind of subsample match subgroup um, with a, a discretization of a binary variable that also for connoisseurs happens to be endogenous with the treatment. Uh, it's just not, it's, it's a totally reasonable analysis. It's very, very reasonable to do this analysis. It's just not the first analysis that I would have done. So I, uh, thanks to the authors who posted their data, uh, I was able to do the first analysis that I would have done, which is, did the uh, groups differ in their end of year performance or in their different scores? And the answer was no, nothing was going on. I, so I don't know whether the authors actually planned these subgroup analyses as the first thing and we just differ on our view of how to evaluate this trial and what the key outcomes were, uh, or whether they did this analysis, found nothing, and then went with that one. I'm not sure, um, but for me, this really, pushed me over the edge because pre-registration here would have established whether the decisions were made a priori or in a data-dependent manner. And if they'd been made data-dependent, then this, I think, clearly invalidates the inferential uh, status of the p-values that they reported from these statistical tests. I also think this was a fabulous case study of open data because it really allowed me to evaluate the alternative hypotheses here and draw my own conclusions. So I think this was basically a win and I really commend the authors for doing this and for engaging with me when I push them on these analytic decisions. So that, that leads me to my very last point, which is that uh, all of this has brought me um, as both a researcher and a lab manager towards the position that everything should be open by default. And by default, I mean there are plenty of cases where we can't be open, uh, where privacy, where proprietary data sets, where concerns about preemption should lead us uh, reasonably to close our process. But for the rest of the time, there's really no reason why our, um, our laundry shouldn't be out on display. It's not that dirty. It's not any dirtier than anybody else's. Um, so this is, um, this is my GitHub account. Um, we've uh, adopted GitHub and Git as a version control system for distributed uh, version control of all of the materials, data, and writing related to our uh, scientific work. This is the, uh, the repository for that particular piece of work on this Berkowitz uh, paper. Um, and you know, if you really cared that much about the science that I was doing, which I seriously doubt, you could go poke around and see what's up right now, um, see, see all the stuff that's in progress. Um, but th this workflow has led us to, uh, you know, it's, the openness is in some sense secondary because it's led us to this really nice way of working um, where uh, we 
code in a literate way that's meant to be read by outsiders. And sometimes, very rarely, the outsiders are people who actually care about our science. Much more frequently, it's like us in two months who are trying to figure out what we did when we were coding. Um, or or um, as an advisor, it's me trying to figure out what in the world my student is doing uh, when they do something new and exciting and innovative and I just can't follow it. So we've started uh, posting all of our code, not just as code, but as literate programming um, that allows us to read through and um, document and understand uh, the um, analytic paths and choices that we take. Uh, and that leads us to this practice of just putting everything out there. So this is our lab publication page. You note there's a sort of minor change, which is just for every paper, even those that are under review, there's just a link to the GitHub repository. Not every paper. There's some where, for whatever reason, we couldn't share the data. We uh, were asked not to by the journal. We had uh, some concerns. But as our default practice, we just try to put that repository link along with the paper. And there's a very small added cost, essentially no added cost, for this step of sharing, and our workflow has been improved. Um, okay, so to conclude, uh, what I'm arguing for today is cha are changes to default practice. None of these changes is right for every project. Uh, and I think there, you know, there are real trade-offs that we can consider between these practices. For example, um, if an experiment is too expensive to replicate, then it becomes ever more important to pre-register. On the other hand, the pre-registration actually, I think, in my mind, adds less than the direct replication if the direct replication is possible. If it's cheap, if we just hit the button again, run a new sample of people on our survey, then actually that direct uh, replication to me adds additional evidential value beyond knowing that the p-value is, uh, is uh, interpretable. It also adds estimations of the true variability of the measurement and the way it depends on uh, irrelevant factors. So, I think uh, these things are really important to consider uh, in terms of uh, thinking about trade-offs. Uh, it's especially important when these recommendations can increase cost. Uh, for example, it's not always possible to increase the N of a study. Uh, and sometimes we need to publish exploratory low-end studies because there's no other alternative, um, for example, in field contexts. So what I want to argue more generally is that psychology and the social sciences more generally face substantial methodological challenges, but incremental changes to our default practices, some of which uh, improve the workflow and make things faster and easier anyway, are gonna bring us closer to the kind of cumulative enterprise that we want. Thanks very much. <laughs>